Okay. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today while we present to you our fourth year design project, a quartz crystal microbalance sensor for internal bleeding detection. My name is Ivana Yachi Zarakowski, and with me here I have Ms. Alicia Veyu to present. Joining us afterwards for questions is Mr. Brandon Yi. Our final partner, Ms. Erica Winches, can be found at our poster. A surgeon's biggest fear after a successful surgery is that a post-operative complication can occur. Heavy dangers associated with surgeries can last up to two months into the recovery stage, while lesser dangers, dangers can last even longer. In terms of internal bleeding, it has been reported that 5 to 7 percent of patients who have undergone a cardiac surgery will experience excessive blood loss in their recovery stage. This level of blood loss is associated with an eightfold increase in mortality. Having a, a blood loss that high will require the need for a second surgery if caught in time. Another issue with blood loss is that of intestinal adhesion. When blood get, even a small amount of blood that can get introduced into the peritoneal cavity can cause our organs to stick together. This is an increasing problem for surgeons who need to complete a second surgery. The introduction of blood into the cavity, if known ahead of time, will allow the surgeon to prepare for their impending surgery accordingly. In addition, being able to remotely monitor one's pa a patient's recovery externally allows for a patient to be discharged from the hospital ahead of time. This allows a patient to recover in the comfort of their own home and is also likely more cost effective. Our group has teamed up with Nerve Technologies Incorporated, a startup company here at the University of Waterloo. Nerve aims to create an implantable biosensor to detect, monitor, and report post-operative complications in real time. Our group's goal was to create a blood sensor to be incorporated onto their platform to detect blood introduction into the peritoneal cavity. So what exactly is our market? It has been reported that in the US alone, there are 12.7 million gynecological, general, and obstetrical surgeries performed each year. We chose to focus on the surgeries that are considered to be high risk for post-operative complications. Of the total amount of surgeries, about 13% are consider considered to fall into this category. A high-risk surgery has a cost of about $12,500 American dollars per, per, per patient. This will result in a total available market of about $25.5 billion American. Our sensor is designed to be implanted into the peritoneal cavity during the surgery. The cavity is composed of peritoneal fluid. This fluid contains water, electrolytes, leukocytes, and antibodies. It has a reported density of 1.032 grams per centimeter cubed and a known viscosity of 1.425 millipascal seconds. It is likely that the introduction of blood into this fluid, such as that from an internal bleeding issue, will cause a change in viscosity. So we have laid out some customer requirements that we felt were crucial to our design. They have been organized into primary, secondary, and tertiary sections. Our primary requirements involved a detection limit of one milliliter of blood for every liter of peritoneal fluid. This is the minimum amount of blood we wish to be able to detect and should correspond to a viscosity change of 0.125%. In addition, because this sensor is intended to be implanted in the body, it had to be biocompatible. We also wish to have a continuous sensing platform. A high sensitivity is desired so that we can even detect the small amount of blood that can cause intestinal adhesion. We also wish to minimize noise in order to decrease the number of false readings we would have. Our secondary requirements involved an even stricter detection limit. This was two microliters for every liter of blood. This was specified as the absolute ideal by our customer nerve. We also needed a solution that is cost effective to compete with the current costs of hospital monitoring after surgery. 
A minimal energy consumption was also desired. This is because we want to run our sensor off a battery that can last up to two months and a battery that is also small enough to be implanted in the body. We also wanted to be able to accurately detect blood against other fluids in the peritoneal cavity. Our tertiary requirements mostly involved the scaling down of our sensor to be implanted into the body. The sensor had to be less than two centimeters in diameter and had to have a biocompatible housing. We also needed to minimize drift. We want our sensor to last two months in the body, meaning that we needed to have a signal that can be constantly read that's consistent. Also, in a perfect world, our sensor would be biodegradable, meaning that none of the sensor would be left in the patient's body forever. Our solution makes use of a quartz crystal microbalance, or a QCM for short. Quartz is a piezoelectric material, meaning that the application of an AC voltage to it will cause the quartz to vibrate at a specific resonant frequency. An introduction of an external stress to the quartz will cause this resonant frequency to change, and we can detect this resonant frequency change. It is known, and we have shown, that our sensor can monitor for blood in the peritoneal cavity using a quartz crystal microbalance by just measuring for changes in viscosity. So in order to use our quartz crystal microbalance, we had to make some assumptions. For one, we wanted to know that our QCM reading and resonant frequency is purely due to the resonant frequency specified in the specification sheet received from our provider. We also wanted to, we had to assume that the shift in resonant frequency is only due to the introduction of blood in the cavity. We also treated blood as a suspension of red blood cells. With this model, we can model the frequency shift using the equation shown above. Using this equation, we found that we can have a minimum detectable viscosity change of 0.0231%. Okay, so uh, in terms of our design, there were a few key components. Uh, first of all, of course, was the uh, QCM. Uh, now, because uh, quartz crystal microbalances aren't uh, widespread yet in uh, the consumer world, uh, we were fairly limited in what was available. Uh, there were just two options, either 5 megahertz or 10 megahertz. And for us, it was more uh, feasible to t pick a commercially available quartz crystal than to try and make one from scratch, because that would just be a project in itself. Um, so what we went with is a standard uh, one inch diameter quartz crystal microbalance with a five megahertz resonance frequency. Um, and it's uh, ET cut, which uh, is just fancy talk uh, to explain like the way that it's cut. Um, AT cut particularly is just that the quartz crystal was cut around uh, 35 degrees from the Z axis plane. And uh, the electrodes on this quartz crystal are a chromium gold alloy. Um, and the reason why it's an alloy rather than just pure gold is uh, for um, just cost purposes. It's cheaper that way. And uh, for our application, we actually chose to coat the top electrode of the quartz crystal microbalance using a titanium dioxide uh, deposition to improve uh, the biocompatibility of our uh, sensor. So in terms of uh, like the, how to make the circuit oscillate, uh, we had to um, use a driver circuit. This is called a Pierce oscillator circuit, and as the name implies, its function is to induce oscillation in the quartz crystal. Uh, so this circuit in particular was taken from the NE455 lab, um, and we chose for our application to opt for a compensated circuit. Uh, what that means basically is uh, we have added a, a resistor and inductor uh, in series with the quartz crystal, and the purpose of that is to stabilize the signal because our application is in a liquid medium, and uh, you do have uh, some dampening effects that you do see when you are in the liquid medium, so that's why we chose uh, the compensated circuit. And uh, the values that are shown in this table were also taken from the uh, NE455 lab uh, for simplicity's sake. So 
The next key component of our uh, device was uh, to use an Arduino as your frequency counter. Uh, basically, there were two main functions for the Arduino. One, as I just said, uh, we used it to count the frequency. And then uh, the second function of the Arduino was to provide power for our device. Um, so the frequency counter itself is a s open source software that we found online and made minor mi modifications to. Um, mostly uh, the main changes that we made was uh, we removed the code for the thermistor because uh, due to time constraints, we didn't have time to add that into our design. And the other change that we made uh, were to um, improve the, the readings that we saw on the, uh, uh, the monitor of our computer. Um, we changed that to make the reading more uh, visually pleasing. Um, so in terms of power, the Arduino has a five volt output, uh, which we use to um, power the PCB and uh, induce oscillation in the circuit. Uh, and the clock speed of the Arduino is actually also very important because it needs to be at least double that of the quartz crystal or else the uh, read and write uh, functions of the frequency code won't work um, because the, the five megahertz will be too fast uh, for the clock on the Arduino to count. Um, so our first attempt, uh, phase one, was uh, we decided to make our PS oscillator circuit on a breadboard and connect the Arduino and uh, the quartz crystal to the breadboard that way. Uh, we also connected an oscilloscope to the breadboard to make sure that our output was what we were expecting to see. Um, and so with every first attempt comes a few issues. Uh, in our first attempt, we noticed that the uh, sine wave wasn't perfectly sinusoidal, and uh, there were a few reasons for that. Uh, first of all was uh, connection problems with the breadboard. Um, every time that we tried to uh, run it for the first time in the day, we'd spend around like half an hour debugging because there was a wire somewhere that just had decided overnight to either burn out or cut off. And so that took a lot of time and uh, was one of the reasons why we chose to go uh, with a PCB. Um, another reason that we chose to go with a PCB was uh, the op amp that we needed for the Schmidt trigger, which I'll talk about later, was only available as a surface mount. And so uh, later on when we realized that we needed a square wave, uh, we weren't able to do that on the breadboard, so we had to move to a PCB. Um, so in terms of issues related to the square wave, uh, we found that our frequency counter wasn't giving us consistent results uh, when we were trying to read the uh, frequency. And the reason for that was uh, the read and write functions were out of sync with the sine wave. Uh, so what that means was that when the, uh, the, the frequency counter would read the frequency, it was at one value, but then when it would write, it was at a different value. And so that's why we were seeing some oscillations. So from that, we were like, well, we need to fix that. And the best way to do that was to have a threshold voltage at which uh, that, the, the voltage became on high, this is the value. And then below that voltage, it was off. And this is, this is the value off. Um, so we checked to make sure that that was the case by switching out the quartz crystal for a uh, function generator and using a square wave. And that solved our um, problem with uh, the consistency of the results. So that's uh, why we chose to use a Schmidt trigger. So a Schmidt trigger is a fairly simple circuit. It's composed of an op, op amp and a few resistors. And as I said earlier, the purpose of this circuit is to uh, convert a sinusoidal signal to a square wave. And it works by having a threshold voltage, at which point when uh, the voltage is above that threshold, it uh, outputs uh, high, and then when it's below that threshold voltage, it uh, outputs low. And uh, the values that we chose uh, for the resistors uh, in this op amp, we, uh, we found online and uh, through a variety of other sources uh, to support our choices. I don't know if that's gonna switch, there we go. So this is uh, our schematic circuit model. Uh, basically, the way that it works is uh, the Schmidt trigger is connected at the output of the quartz crystal. And uh, that way it takes in a sinusoidal wave and we measure, uh, we monitor the output of uh, the Schmidt trigger. Uh, now for our phase two, 
uh, we had to design our PCB schematic, which means convert our initial uh, circuit schematic to something in Eagle CAD. Um, and we followed best practices. We uh, put in uh, some um, a microcontroller and uh, the op amp to uh, be part of the Schmidt trigger. Um, there were uh, also we added a few floating grounds uh, just for best practices to ensure like proper grounding in the uh, circuit. And then uh, for our phase three in the future, basically this is kind of the vision that we had for our design. We would uh, expect that the quartz crystal would be on the surface of a housing and we would have our PCB and electronics below that within the housing and hidden away from the environment of the, uh, the, the body. Uh, and it would be uh, fairly small in size uh, based on what we need, like it's fairly easy to shrink our PCB down. Uh, we had a few things like that. And then so finally for testing, uh, we used uh, two things for our testing. First, we tested with the uh, Q uh, Think SRS QCM200. Uh, and basically the way that that works is that it shows you your frequency and tells you uh, the frequency that your crystal is oscillating at. And uh, in terms of uh, what we tested, we used a variety of solutions with different concentrations of uh, sucrose to monitor changes in uh, frequency and show that indeed uh, there was a correlation between the change in frequency and the change in viscosity of the solution. So uh, to make sure that our results were stabilized, we left the QCM in solution for about 10 minutes for each solution to make sure that our results were uh, consistent and stable. So here is uh, our first pass at results, and they were very, very interesting results. Um, we compared both the coded and uncoded quartz crystal to the theoretical value and found that um, there was a dampening effect for the coded crystal, but we also saw that there was no effect on the sensitivity of the crystal because you can see that those lines are very parallel, which indicates that there is the, the frequency has decreased, but its sensitivity and ability to detect changes in the solution has not. Um, and so that, that was a very good sign for us. And then also we found that the results were of a linear dependency, which makes it fairly easy for us to uh, figure out the changes in, in viscosity, whereas if it was nonlinear, it would be a little bit more complicated and there have to be a bunch of equations that we use to try and figure out like what the actual um, relationship is. Uh, so in terms of noise, uh, when we were testing the uh, QCM, we found that there was approximately a variation of three hertz um, between the, the, the frequency that we were monitoring. Um, so that's, that, that, was, that was that. <laughs> and then uh, the last test that we did was uh, we tested our PCB results using the frequency counter that we created. And there were issues, um, mostly there, there are some hardware issues and some software issues that still need to be debugged, which is kind of why the results are a little bit more um, nonlinear. And uh, but what's really important to notice is you still see that dampening trend almost exactly, which does indicate that it, it is working in the sense that um, it, it, it's, uh, you, it's being consistent in what it's measuring. Um, so there, like I said, there are a few sources of error that we do need to focus on. Um, when testing in air, um, for our tests, light is actually a factor some, somewhat, but that wouldn't really be an issue when testing in the body. Um, what would be an issue is uh, pressure and temperature, which uh, we would need to um, normalize somewhat um, by establishing a background of some sorts. Uh, so that, that would be something that we need to look into in the future. So in conclusion, uh, we did show that uh, changes, like we introduced that changes uh, in viscosity by the introduction of blood is something that can be monitored by a QCM and we did that by testing solutions of different viscosities to show that 
um, the QCM is sensitive enough to detect those changes. And uh, we were able to create a prototype that is able to measure changes in frequency, which was ultimately like our encompassing goal was to be able to design that. Um, so future steps, uh, we do want to try and improve our detection limit um, because as of right now, it's, it's a, like I think within one order of magnitude of what we want. Um, we do want to reduce the device size because right now our device is on the macro scale and we're trying to design something that's implantable and that's just um, putting in more time trying to shrink things down and uh, thinking a little bit more about uh, what is essential in the, the device. And uh, the last two are uh, noise reduction and improvement of long-term stability, which um, I believe that we would be able to achieve with a little bit more research and refining of the electronics that we chose. Uh, so we do want to say a few thank yous. Uh, we want to say thank you to Dr. Christopher Backhouse, who was our advisor, um, Dr. John Zahad, who was our lord and savior when it came to this project. Um, he provided us with the quartz crystals. He helped us. Um, with the, the design of, like with his 455 lab was really, really helpful. Uh, we want to thank Rasul Kishavarzi, who uh, helped us solder some of the smallest pieces of electronics that I've ever seen. And uh, we also want to thank Nerve Technologies for providing us with their wealth of information and doing the TIO2 deposition for us. Uh, Sean Vander Hayden, who was uh, our advisor when it came to trying to debug our PCB and figure out what the problems were and uh, Jen Kogan, who helped us purchase all of the uh, things that we needed for our project and uh, was our, the purchasing coordinator. So thank you, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I don't know how long that was. We have time for maybe one question. Yes. Question just stands for my lack of knowledge. How do you project a device like this from a fairly dry, pristine environment? So actually what we found was one of the changes or one of the issues which was pressure um, would be dampened actually inside the body because it's a constant pressure. Also the light would fairly be constant as well. The temperature change would be fixed likely with just a thermosistor that could be added into the circuit with further refinements. Does anyone have anything? Yeah, and there's also the possibility of adding um, a like baseline sensor that just kind of d has like the background noise, which cancels out um, anything that seems off, versus like because that one would be isolated and then the other one would be exposed to the body. So, yeah. any other questions? Do we have time for that? Okay. 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 Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.